2011 has seen protests sweep across the United States on a scale that's caught many off guard. A call to action from both American unions and the Occupy Wall Street movement. It's not hard to see why there is so much anger on the streets. Officially, the unemployment rate hovers around 9%. But when you include part-time workers and those who've given up looking for work, that rate is above 15 percent. And it's not privacy! Where are you taking him? And the gap between the very rich and the rest continues to grow. The middle class that built this country, and it's the middle class that keeps this country going, and they're shipping our jobs overseas, and nobody seems to give a damn. And I give a damn. In swing states, Republican politicians are taking union head-on as an election year approaches. Organized labor across America is in a fight for its very existence. And it does feel like there's an orchestrated movement to vilify and blame unions for all our problems. Meanwhile, workers are scrambling to protect the wages and benefits that they have. We're not asking for the whole pie. We just want a piece of what rightfully belongs to us. guys. Sunday morning at the New Covenant Baptist Church on the north side of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. For many here, prayer provides hope for an impoverished community. Milwaukee is the fourth poorest city. It's also the second most segregated city between white and African Americans. Unemployment rates here are among the highest in the country. For African American males, nearly one out of three are out of work. If you drive through this neighborhood, you will see uh, people who are, who are hopeless, uh, who don't get a chance to live and enjoy the benefits of what this nation is supposedly about. Earl Ingram is a local talk show host. Radio is his second career after losing his first when the A.O. Smith factory, which later became Tower Automotives, shut its doors for good in 2006. Earl's father worked here too, building frames for automobiles. And uh, so my dad working here allowed us to move to this neighborhood, which was predominantly white at that point in time. It's a common storyline across the Midwest. A factory opens up and brings with it jobs that paid middle-class wages. The factory shuts down, the jobs go overseas, and the neighborhood falls apart. It provided opportunities for those who worked here to send their children on to universities. Do you think that could have happened if there wasn't an active union at Absolutely this not. Uh, companies aren't gonna be benevolent. We see it today. Uh, you're not gonna be able to get companies to do the right thing. Companies are, and their main focus is profit. Unions have existed in some form in the United States since the early 1800s. Their influence grew by the turn of the 20th century. The time period leading up to the Great Depression was marred by violence, strikes, and riots against employers. In order to control growing unrest and ensure the smooth flow of industry, the Democratic government in 1935 passed the National Labor Relations Act, also known as the Wagner Act. It recognized that this was an equalizer, that this was an inherently, always will be, always is an unequal contest. It is completely impossible for workers to challenge corporate power, especially today certainly in the 1930s, but then again today, without an equalizer. And the governmental structure is supposed to be our equalizer. Labor unions revolutionized the American workplace. They fought for better safety standards, higher wages, and pensions, the very things that workers today are finding themselves struggling to hold on to. As the 1970s and 80s ushered in a new economy, where capital went global in search of cheap labor, 
tens of thousands of unionized factory jobs moved overseas. Today, private union membership has plummeted to just 7% of the workforce. Those who criticize unions say that labor is still trying to follow an unrealistic economic model from the past. The unions are still aggressive, they're still trying to organize, because that's their bread and butter, but it's, it's a different world. Unless they change, unless they understand the pressures that all businesses are under, all employers are under, uh, they may very well become obsolete. In early 2011, Wisconsin's capital, Madison, saw the largest protest in the history of the state. As many as 100,000 people took to the streets. Republican Governor Scott Walker was changing the law. One that had been in place since 1959, stripping the right of public sector workers to bargain collectively on issues such as health care costs, pensions, and workplace conditions. Thousands of union members and their allies occupied the state capitol and its grounds. Uh, just showing folks our resolve, and I think that now has helped to basically perpetuate a greater and deeper sense of commitment and awareness to uh, what's happening in America right now. 1670 WTDY, Sly in the Morning. And Madison, Wisconsin is a union town. So I, I want to kind of get an update of what's going on in the trenches. All right. People are getting hurt out there bad. And the good news is we're building a movement. This isn't just Dane County or Rock County, but uh, Wisconsin and now the nation is really starting to stand up. It's phenomenal. Ed Sadlowski Jr. is a fourth generation trade unionist. He's a staff representative for AFSCME, the largest public service employees union nationwide. The common theme in union meetings is Ed, I'm not sure how long I can keep this job. It's not a job worth having anymore. It's not worth coming in. I'm not going to be able to afford my home. Ed works with unions in Rock County, where this highway shop for the county's public works department is located. Most of the workers here are unionized. From January 2012, they will have to start contributing additional money for their own pensions and health care. How do you think you're going to feel the impact of what's just happened? Oh, I think uh, quite a bit. I mean, I've, my wife has been unemployed for a year and a half. She's going to school full time right now for medical assistance, so it's going to hurt a lot. Uh, we certainly said, listen, we've got to take the state in a different direction, and one of the ways we're going to do that is by taking back some of the power that the unions currently hold. Scott Fitzgerald is the Republican majority leader in the Wisconsin State Senate and a close ally of the governor. Some of your critics say that this is um, a veiled attack on the middle class. Yeah, I disagree. I mean, I think um, what I'm more concerned about is the level of taxation and just uh, the average Wisconsinite that currently is struggling uh, who is paying part of their health insurance or is paying part of their pension. Schools became a key battleground in Wisconsin's union fight. Teachers and other school employees have displayed some of the fiercest opposition to the new law. And I always tell people, it's not just about the teacher's pocketbook. Also, in tandem with that, was taking something like $8 million from the budget to public schools. Peggy Coyne is the president of the Madison Teachers Union. She says that public education is a foundation of American democracy because it gives everyone the opportunity to get educated, irrespective of socioeconomic background. The legislative piece, which was billed as a budget repair bill by a governor who started out by giving huge tax breaks to corporations, by a governor who wanted to increase the voucher and school choice system, which means diverting public school money to private schools. And it just felt wrong. The message from Republicans is that the state's budget deficit needs to be fixed now. And since private sector workers are already being paid less, public sector workers need to accept the same. The way things are going to be, you're not going to have the same health plan that you have now. And workers keep, say the problem is on the revenue side. Exactly 
an estimated $2.3 billion in tax breaks for businesses and high-income individuals over the next 10 years. You have a situation though where workers have lost benefits and at the same time corporations have received tax breaks. Uh, we definitely made a commitment to come up with a package that would once again create an environment in Wisconsin where people would understand that this is a place to not only expand your business, but bring your business to Wisconsin. Scott Fitzgerald and people of his ilk are concerned about a handful who control the wealth of this nation and the masses of the people. It doesn't matter what color you are. Uh, if you don't have any money, you, don't, you have no value. Is there a political benefit for the Republican Party to weaken unions here in Wisconsin? Oh, I think um, just like there's the same advantage for the Democrats to strengthen the unions, um, I think that there are certainly people making the case that the Republicans are going to benefit from this. Okay, okay, all those opposed to five minutes. Any dent in the Democratic Party's support base, of which unions are historically a part of, could be a crucial advantage for Republicans in the upcoming 2012 election. That's a big debate, so... And the Wisconsin fight is not an isolated one. So maybe we should table that. Republican governors have pushed forward similar measures in Indiana, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, all swing states. It's at 6.30, and it's at St. John's Episcopal Church, which is our... But in Ohio, church groups, labor unions, and community organizers ran a statewide campaign in November to defeat an anti-union bill known as no, Issue 2. Okay, we're urging people to vote no on Issue 2. It was put to the electorate, and over 60% of the voters said no. All right, you have a great day. God bless you. It was a resounding victory for the unions, and it proved that they still have the strength to mobilize people in large numbers to their cause. The organizing around Issue 2 brought the labor movement together with its traditional partner, the Democratic Party. It's a relationship that has seen its fair share of complications and has left unions with few political choices. I don't think that they deliberately took us for granted because it was never a question that they had to answer. They've always taken us for granted. With Obama's 2008 election and his promise of a new era, many in the movement dared to hope that this could be a new chapter in a battered relationship. Labor pushed hard for the Employee Free Choice Act, meant to simplify the process for workers seeking to join a union. In this country, we believe that if the majority of workers in a company want a union, they should get a union. That's not complicated. That's the right thing to do. We can do it. But the bill died when President Obama failed to push it through the Senate. We can do all of these things. I feel sorry, I guess, for, I have a lot of friends who are in unions. They spent one heck of a lot of money electing President Obama and a Democratic House and Democratic Senate, this is what they wanted and they got nothing for their investment. The Employee Free Choice Act was not the first legislative priority, that was health care. Wilma Liebman chaired the National Labor Relations Board, or NLRB, the federal government's agency that oversees labor relations when the bill failed to pass. There were so many things going on at that point. There was the stimulus, there was health care, there were oh, just so many things going on at once and I think labor is, is justified in their feeling that their issues weren't put first. A largely unionized workforce is celebrating the unveiling of Boeing's state-of-the-art 787 Dreamliner at its plant outside Seattle, Washington. After more than three years of delays, the first plane was finally delivered to the Japanese airline, ANA. The Boeing story reveals a great deal about the state of organized labor and labor law, which is fast becoming a very political issue. Boeing has spent $750 million on a plan to assemble additional aircraft. The site they chose is thousands of miles away from Washington, in South Carolina, a predominantly non-union state. Working with our global partners, the 787 team. Boeing Vice President Jim Albo claimed they built the plant there because of work stoppages and escalating wages in Washington. He blamed the local aerospace machinist union for both. The general counsel of the NLRB issued a complaint against Boeing, alleging that its decision to move production was a form of retaliation against the union. Corporate America has got to realize that, that we're the ones that, that 
make them the money. Workers here have not been afraid to take action against Boeing. The most recent strike by the machinist union lasted for 58 days in 2008, when more than 25,000 workers walked out on the job. The rates of scale pay, the benefits, the retirement, and all the things associated with that are part of a, a union, that we want to be able to pass those on to future generations. We need to maintain that, that standard of living. It's playing into the presidential election coming up, and that's a shame that that the focus of the issue is, is being lost in that. You know, the National Labor Relations Board is there to protect workers' rights. If you can't go to a state and start a company, and, and if the White House disagrees with your decision, that's a dictatorship. That's not a constitutional republic. Congressional Republicans, including Steve King, seized on the issue to attack the very existence of the Labor Board. I think it's party politics. I think it's President Obama's, at least the image of his favoritism towards unions that brings some of this about. And I think this Congress will step up and put the brakes on the NLRB's efforts. Republicans had taken up Boeing's cause and had threatened to defund the entire institution. Before the NLRB could rule on the Boeing case, and less than a week before this show went to air, Boeing and the union agreed to new terms for workers in Washington, and the case was dropped. But it still means that Boeing was able to flout U.S. labor law with impunity. It is really an all-out war over the legitimacy of labor law collective bargaining. All this controversy shows that labor law really matters. We've got to gr focus on growing this economy, putting people back to work, and making sure that the American dream is there, not just for this generation, but for the next generation. It's almost certain that the economy and chronic unemployment will be the defining issues of the 2012 election. In January 2011, President Obama created the White House Jobs and Competitiveness Council. The council's task is to come up with ideas on how to create jobs. Obama appointed Jeff Immelt, the CEO of General Electric, the sixth largest corporation in America, to lead it. What we have is, a, is I think, a fraudulent commission or a fraudulent committee, I use that word deliberately, uh, that is essentially there to give the appearance that there's something being done on behalf of jobs in the United States when, in fact, all the evidence would point that these employers are heading for the exits. Chris Townsend is the Washington representative for the United Electrical Workers Union. Hey, what's going on? They represent part of General Electric's remaining so unionized workers. How on earth could this administration or any administration have picked this corporation to uh, chair council that has as part of its, the major part of its goal, coming up with ideas to actually rejuvenate the U.S. economy? It just doesn't square with the facts. This is a company that is closed 31 U.S. facilities, manufacturing and service facilities in the last four years. 20% of GE's American workforce has been cut since 2004. All of it on Immelt's watch, who has repeatedly said that his primary responsibility is to his shareholders. Now, we clearly know that the Republican Party and its corporate sponsors have announced that their goal is to exterminate unions as organizations and do that through all the various means that they would do it. Uh, and we have a Democratic Party that really has great difficulty in saying it's against that. And we have no alternative. It's not a democratic system. It's a thoroughly corrupt system. It's a thoroughly corporatized system, polluted with money. And it, there just isn't anything about it that's fair or balanced or, uh, or the least bit democratic, sadly. So we find ourselves as unions again and again and again having to pick from the least of the worst and that's where we'll be again next year. Frustrated with Obama and under attack from the Republican Party, organized labor has had to look away from Washington for energy. Some unions have found it in the Occupy movement. This march in Chicago was the beginning of four days of different actions aimed at raising awareness about issues of economic justice. Union members, community groups, and members of the Occupy movement were out together on the streets. We're talking about the accountability of the people who don't have a problem taking your money and laughing at you. Let's go find these people and show them a real Chicago welcome. Protesters marched on the annual meeting of the National Mortgage Bankers Association, occupying the hotel and getting arrested. This is one of the chief 
chemicals of Wall Street greed. Some also took direct action against big banks that have foreclosed homes and left the houses abandoned. On Chicago's north side, community members cleaned up this house, mowed the lawn, and boarded up the windows to keep the property secure. They then took the garbage downtown to Chase and Bank of America headquarters and literally dumped it out where they said it belonged. Five elder ladies have been arrested here in Chicago. This protest is part of a wider national protest movement across the U.S. There have been similar protests in Baltimore, in D.C., in L.A., in Atlanta. And today's events have wrapped up. But as you can see from the protest, they're making it clear that they are not going anywhere. Our streets! Our streets! Our streets! We are the 99%! We are the 99%! We are the 99%! Occupy Wall Street has brought together Americans from all walks of life. It's also injected energy into the labor movement. When Occupy Wall Street briefly became Occupy Times Square in New York in October, union members proudly represented among the thousands of protesters. The ones we spoke to see a lot of their own struggle in the ideals that the movement is fighting for. Honestly, it's something that uh, we in the union movement have been waiting for for uh, literally decades, um, for people to pick up some of the issues that we've been concerned about, and boom, here it is, and it's, it's mushroomed into this big thing, and so we're, to say the least, elated. What I'm seeing here today is wonderful. I'm seeing white collar, blue collar, union, non-union, unemployed, underemployed, young, old, all different demographics. This is an American experience, and I'm so proud to be a part of it. Said, what's up, Nasdaq? Said, time to pay back. While Occupy Wall Street's energy may be exactly what the labor movement has been lacking, it's very different from the top-down leadership of most labor unions and their focus on electoral politics. I'm hesitant to be overly optimistic about the relationship. What I am encouraged by is the fact that the directly democratic aspects of these protests seem to really be inspiring to rank and file union members. And I'm hopeful that perhaps that inspiration can be leveraged against the leadership to prevent them from selling out these movements down the line. For now, America's labor movement remains locked in a battle for its very survival. While it may be sapped of its prior political influence and diminished in members, its leaders claim that it's far from dead. Show them you're angry! Pointing to victory in Ohio and mobilization in Wisconsin as evidence that there's still life. And at a time when inequality in America is growing, when the fault lines have never been clearer, Let's push back. there may never be a better opportunity for organized labor to regain what it has lost, or even become part of something new. I think at some point we'll know when we're crossing the Rubicon in positive territory, when we stop occupying empty parks and start occupying buildings and factories. We get and uh, take back what's ours. <laughs>